We played basketball in a different world. The controversy. Most of the guys on the floor, seven out of 10, were black. In 1963, it was a sight to make your eyes pop out. The adversity. There are blacks on one side and whites on the other. They were loud and boisterous. The hate that they had toward us, the verbal insults, the threats. I was scared to death. It was because there were so many African Americans on the team. The game of change. I relive it in my mind <laughs> almost daily. This is more than a ball game. This is history. The team that helped change the color of college basketball. How do you describe that? It's the greatest feeling in the world. In 1963, the Loyola Ramblers men's basketball program won the NCAA National Championship, a remarkable feat, especially for a small Jesuit commuter school. But the Ramblers championship still remains unmatched by any other collegiate basketball program in the state of Illinois. It's a little piece of trivia that most sports fans around Chicagoland already know. But what's even more remarkable than the title itself is certainly less well known. That's the story behind the Ramblers championship season the impact it had not only on college basketball, but on a country in racial turmoil at the height of the civil rights era. That incredible story is brought to light now 50 years later. I have a memory of watching the Loyola Cincinnati final in 1963 uh, with my dad. I was growing up in Fairlawn, New Jersey. Many years later, I came to Chicago where Loyola's championship is sort of just in the air. The ball's in the air and controlled by Cincinnati. The Loyola Ramblers and Cincinnati Bearcats met in the NCAA Men's Division I Championship game in 1963, a year when civil rights in America was at the forefront in the fight against racial segregation, discrimination, and inequality were being legally challenged in a court of law. It was evident that racial change also found its way to the basketball court, with two integrated teams competing in the first nationally televised title game. The country witnessed an overtime thriller that wasn't decided until the final second. All right, this is got it. Here he goes. He jumps. He passes out to Hunter. Hunter shoots. He off the rim. Brown gets the score. It's over. It's over. It's over. We won. We won. We won. Viola won the ball game. Oh, we won it. We won. The putback by Vic Rouse that upset the two-time defending national champion Cincinnati Bearcats at the buzzer will forever go down as one of Chicago's most unforgettable sports victories. Over 50 years have gone by since the Ramblers' championship season in 1963. It's now memorialized in the rafters at Loyola's Gentile Center, but that banner doesn't tell the entire story. It wasn't until I understood the racial significance of the story that I really got sucked into it. And I went looking for the book that I assumed I would find to learn more about it, and there was no book. So I think that was about five years ago. Here we are. Award-winning journalist Michael Linehan is the author of the book Ramblers, the team that changed the color of college basketball, which hit the shelves this past year. Loyola suited up four black players in the starting lineup. Their opposition in the title game, Cincinnati, started three. So on the sport's biggest stage, seven of the ten players on the floor were African American, a powerful image for a racially divided country to see. When people tuned into this game, they were seeing something for the first time that you and I would accept as commonplace today. And the ball knocked away, but rebound by Leslie Hunter, and he gets it up and scores! But in the words of one of the Cincinnati players in 1963, it was a sight to make your eyes pop out. Loyola's championship victory over Cincinnati went down in the record books, but a game the Ramblers won just eight days earlier belongs in the history books. The Ramblers battled discrimination all season, but it wasn't only integrated teams that were affected by the times. The unwritten rule in Mississippi was that state-supported schools never went to the tournament because there was a prohibition against playing integrated teams. They didn't want to go anywhere. There was a chance that they'd have to play a Negro, as they said in 1963. The Mississippi State Bulldogs, an all-white team from the segregated South, defied state policy 
by sneaking out of Mississippi to play in the NCAA tournament. Their first opponent, the Ramblers. Today, that contest is known as the Game of Change. In his book, Linehan intertwines the stories of Cincinnati and Mississippi State with Loyola's as the three narratives come to a head that year in the tournament. He acknowledges there were many key turning points to the integration of sports and specifically college basketball, but Linehan says the part played by the Loyola Ramblers shouldn't be overlooked. A quote from the book's cover, the Loyola Ramblers have too often been forgotten for their role in basketball's cultural history. They remain a significant, uplifting story. And that story begins with a Maverick head coach named George Ireland. Well, I had a pretty respectable basketball program, even though it was just a little commuter school by the l tracks But Ireland was not continuing in the winning tradition. College basketball pioneer and Hall of Fame coach Lenny Sachs is primarily responsible for establishing the program's success. In 1942, a month before his 20th season as Loyola's head coach, Sachs passed away from a heart attack. But under his direction, Rambler basketball flourished. He coached African-American athletes in the high school ranks, and his goal was to lay the groundwork for Loyola's future desegregating endeavors. Trying to build his own legacy at Loyola a decade later, George Ireland took over in 1951. But by the end of his fifth season, Ireland had compiled a meager sub-500 record. He needed to win. I think he was smart enough to recognize what an economist today would call a, an inefficiency in the marketplace for basketball talent that came from the fact that most coaches were reluctant to have too many blacks on their teams. Even the most open-minded coaches had to wonder how the white student body and the white faculty and the white alumni were going to react to being represented on the basketball team by a bunch of black guys. You could play one black player at home, two on the road, and three if you're way behind. The unspoken rule of most coaches at the time. But Ireland decided it was time to play by his own rules. He needs to win. He's a stubborn, maybe even an angry Irishman. And he sees this market imbalance and he just decides to go where the basketball players are. So he starts looking for players on the playgrounds of New York and in Nashville, Tennessee. Jerry Harkness and Ron Miller were from New York. Vic Rouse and Les Hunter were teammates at Pearl High School in Nashville. They, along with John Egan from St. Rita, an all-white high school on Chicago's South Side, would eventually become Ireland's starting five. He was doing something that most coaches were still not willing to do, but he was stubborn. He didn't care what people thought. He certainly cared about winning, and his Ramblers were doing plenty of it. After a successful campaign in 1962, finishing with 26 wins and advancing to the NIT semifinals, the Ramblers rolled into the 63 season, ranked fourth in the country. A strong start propelled them to the number two spot, and at one point, the Ramblers were 21-0 and led the nation in scoring at 98 points a game. For the first time in school history, Loyola was headed to the NCAA tournament on a collision course with top-ranked Cincinnati. Adversity was sure to await them. But of course, there was plenty this Ramblers team had already faced, both on and off the court. Running the point for the Ramblers in 1963 was John Egan, a hometown kid who played his high school ball at St. Rita. But Egan didn't initially have Loyola in his sights. In my junior year of high school, I was being recruited primarily by Iowa. And Loyola was somewhat of an afterthought for me. I was pretty much certain that I was going to be offered a full scholarship at Iowa. The coach's name was Sharm Sherman at the time. And when he told me that he was going to offer me a one-year renewable scholarship, and I said, you're not going to give me four-year scholarship. Well, if you play well and do it, yes, you're going to earn it. And I said, no, I'll never come here. So with Iowa off the board, Egan headed just 20 miles north of home to play at Loyola for Coach Ireland. He was a nice enough guy, was close. I didn't, of course, know at that time the quality of players that were being recruited by Ireland and that were actually coming to Loyola. I would have certainly been impressed at that time and there would have been no decision to make. Les Hunter and Vic Rouse were the guys from Pearl High School in Nashville. One was 6'6", six, six, one was 6'7". Hunter played center, Rouse played forward, and Ron Miller, New York guy, who was only 6'2", but it had played center in high school. But when he got to Loyola, he was, couldn't play center. He would have to learn how to play guard. 
Chuck Wood, the future sixth man on the championship squad, and six foot nine backup center Rich Rochelle were also a part of Ireland's talented 1960 freshman class. It was apparent to me, even as a freshman, that this was going to be a very special team because of the talented guys that I was with. Along with there were some talented guys on the varsity too, including Jerry Harkness. Jerry Harkness arrived at Loyola a year earlier in the fall of 1959. Four years later, he was a three-time team MVP, a two-time All-American, and now ranks fifth on Loyola's all-time scoring list. Growing up in Harlem, New York, Harkness was initially taught the game of basketball by a local playground director. I got the fundamentals from this guy, and his name was Rucker. Harkness played his first organized basketball under the legendary Holcomb Rucker, whose name is now synonymous with Harlem Playground Basketball. But his basketball skills developed slowly. Even going into his senior year at DeWitt Clinton High School in the Bronx, Harkness had no intentions of ever trying out for the basketball team. It turned out all he needed was a little encouragement. I was just shooting around at the YMCA, and this guy came over to me and said, hey, you're not that bad. And even he said something about college. And I looked at him, my eyes got big. His name was Jackie Robinson. And he made the difference in my life. Harkness tried out for the basketball team. I made the team, number one. And after a week or two, I was starting. And after a month, I was the leading scorer. And then we won everything. When he graduated high school, he won the New York City championship. He was the high scorer of the game, the man of the hour. But even so, Harkness wasn't heavily recruited to play at the next level. The black superstars were well recruited. Everybody wanted those guys, but the second tier of players had nowhere to go. He had a scholarship offer from Texas Southern in Houston, and he was all set to go, but then he got a letter saying that the dorm had burned down and they had to rescind their offer. So he actually sat out a whole year waiting for another opportunity. That opportunity finally came. Harkness left New York and soon found himself near the shores of Lake Michigan, at Loyola's barely integrated Lakeshore campus. It was difficult to a large extent, but luckily we had other black ball players, so we pretty much hung together. The campus was very modest, shall we say. It's nothing like it is today. It was a campus in the middle of the neighborhood, the neighborhood uh, being Rogers Park, also known as the Patch. And it was segregated. You're talking about the early 60s. It was pretty much what I was accustomed to, really, from Evanston Township High School. I didn't let it bother me because I really felt I was there to get an education and to do my job to pay for my education. I had played against black players before but never had a teammate that was black. I was from a segregated area on the south side, Marquette Park. This would be the first time that my teammates, most of the teammates, would be black. By his sophomore season in 1962, Egan was the starting point guard. Harkness, Hunter, and Rouse joined him in the starting lineup, but Ron Miller was forced to contribute off the bench. He was ready for the starting lineup. Ireland was a bit reluctant because that would have been the fourth African-American guy, and he too was sensitive to this. And he told Ron Miller, you know, I can't start you. I think you know why. And Miller knew why. Even as the sixth man, Miller led the Ramblers in scoring through the NIT, averaging 21 points a game. But after a loss to Dayton in the semifinals, Ireland started Miller in the consolation game. Maybe because he thought next season was beginning now, or maybe he just was tired of playing along with this game, Miller became the fourth starter, and he started all the way through the 63 season. The Ramblers began that season ranked fourth in the country behind two of college basketball's blue bloods, Kentucky and Duke. And of course, at number one were the two-time defending national champions, Cincinnati Bearcats. Loyola did nothing to disprove their worthiness among the game's elite. Ireland's fast break formula produced the highest scoring team in the country, totaling over 100 points in each of their first six games to start the season on their way to 21 straight victories. Ireland previously had not been what you would call a run and gun coach. I think he saw what he had. So they pressed and then once they got the ball, they were off and running. It certainly would be said to me when I would go back home, you must be the one calling the shots. You have to be the one. Back in Marquette Park, which is sort of racially tense white area of Chicago. They would tell him, oh yeah, we know, without you, those guys would just run wild and they wouldn't know what to do, according to all the stereotypes of the day. I disappointed many by telling them that it was actually Les Hunter who was calling all the plays, okay? Even if that's not true. <laughs> 
Loyola was NCAA tournament bound for the first time in school history, but a trip south of the Mason-Dixon line to the University of Houston still loomed on the Ramblers' schedule. Ireland had convinced them to play in the segregated South the previous season, knowing full well what his team would have to endure. Ireland told us that we're going to play down in New Orleans, and this is what to expect. When he told us those things, we said, Coach, we're not going. We're not going to take that stuff. He said, wait a minute, this would be good for your race. We can go down there, play really well, and then we would be looked upon maybe a little differently. So we said yes. Soon as we get into New Orleans, you could see colored and white signs all over the place for the bathroom, drinking water. But the thing that really shocked us is when we got in separate cabs. Here the white guys get in a yellow cab, we get in a black cab. So we go into the ball game, there are blacks on one side and whites on the other in the game. New Orleans was so set in its ways, they had segregated seating, but there, other than that, there was nothing during the course of the game. But down in Houston, Houston was a different story altogether. I had never experienced anything like Houston. The University of Houston was initially funded by oil man Hugh Roy Cullen, who once vowed that no black man would ever step foot on campus. They were loud and boisterous, straight out with the N-word, they're throwing money at us. I was scared to death. I mean, I'm gonna tell you, I thought they might come out of the stands. The hate that they had toward us was difficult for us to understand, even though we had run into racism in other places. But the verbal insults, the threats, the throwing of things at us was a new experience. It probably matured us and prepared us for later on in life. Loyola escaped Houston with a four-point victory. The next year, the university officially desegregated, and the basketball program added two black recruits. Of course, this transition wasn't yet welcomed by every institution. Not only was segregation firmly ingrained within the entire Southeastern Conference, but the state of Mississippi and Governor Ross Barnett still barred their schools from even competing against integrated teams. Mississippi State had won the SEC for the fourth time in five years and had never gone to the tournament. Kentucky always got to go in their place because there was a prohibition in Mississippi against playing integrated teams. By 1963, a lot of people in Mississippi were fed up with this rule, and the president of the university decided to send the team to the tournament. Shortly after President Dean Colvert made this already controversial announcement, it was learned that Mississippi State's first opponent would likely be the Ramblers. This touched off furious debate in Mississippi about upholding the Mississippi way of life, and this is the first step down the slope to racial mixing and all kinds of hysteria. Meanwhile, in Chicago, hate mail arrived in the Ramblers' dorms, some directly from members of the Ku Klux Klan. A lot of times, the minority that's wild like that sounds like the majority. But ironically enough, the majority of the people wanted Mississippi State to come and play in the tournament. The Ramblers defeated their first round opponent, Tennessee Tech, rather convincingly. Their 69 point margin of victory still remains an NCAA tournament record. So the regional semifinal in East Lansing was officially set. But for Mississippi State, actually getting there would prove complicated. They were set to leave for East Lansing, Michigan the next day. Word comes to campus that a couple of segregationist politicians had obtained a court order forbidding them to go at the last minute. Babe McCarthy, the coach, had to sneak out so he couldn't get served the injunction. And then the president of the university had to sneak out. And then finally, the players snuck out. The team was split into two parts, what you might call the decoy team. They were to go to the airport to see if they encountered the sheriff or any other kind of resistance when they tried to get on the plane. The first team stays back in the dorm, waiting for word what happened to the decoy team. The reserves run into a sheriff, and the sheriff said, well, fellas, I'm going to take a dinner break and I should be back in two, three hours. So they called the other players to come in and they got on the plane and left, which tells me the majority of the people wanted their team to play in the NCAA. But the stress that was put on those ball players was tough. The Maroons arrived in East Lansing just hours before tip-off, and Harkness could feel the weight of the moment 
when he took center court. I went up to shake the captain's hand and the flash bulb started popping all over the place. And I said, oh my goodness, this is something. <laughs> this is more than a ball game. This is history. The Ramblers advanced 61 to 51, but given the circumstances, there were no losers. The Mississippi team was treated like heroes uh, in East Lansing. When they returned home to Mississippi, they were also treated like heroes. And about uh, less than two years later, Mississippi State enrolled its first black student without any incident. I don't remember one basket, but I remember the handshake. I mean, I was the top scorer. <laughs> I don't remember anything but the handshake in the whole game. The game of change would later prove to hold more significance than any of the players could have imagined. But at the time, the Ramblers were still three wins shy of reaching their ultimate goal. As far as I was concerned, it was another stepping stone for this team moving toward a possible championship. Loyola then defeated Illinois. And they were the Big Ten champs, and it was no problem for them. Then went to the Final Four and played a high-profile team from Duke and creamed them. And they're ranked number two in the nation with three, and we had them by 30 points. And they put on a 20 to four spurt in the second half. And sports writers said something like, you know, the crowd gasped in amazement. Some of the reporters came up to me and acting as if they were surprised. And I said, you know, you're the same guys that are gonna be in here Monday after we beat Cincinnati, acting surprised again. The two-time defending national champions were the heavy favorites to win their third in a row. 19,000 fans gather in Louisville to see Loyola's Ramblers and the University of Cincinnati Bearcats fight for the NCAA basketball title. It was a David versus Goliath situation. The ball's in the air and controlled by Cincinnati. And it was a foregone conclusion that Cincinnati was going to win that game. Shoots off, no good, and Wilson stops it through and they were expected to win it big. Now Cincinnati was another team in the forefront of racial change. Their coach, Ed Jucker, had four black starters the year before, and now they had three. So most of the guys on the floor, seven out of 10, were black. If you understand the power of an image, that one couldn't help but have influenced a lot of young black basketball players and a lot of coaches who were looking to expand their horizons. I was concerned about exactly what happened. That is, they got off to a lead. Backer underneath the eighth and he scores. Cincinnati has got a nine point lead. Then they start holding the ball. It's called keep away. Come out and get it if you can. We're not accustomed to that because we're not accustomed to someone getting the lead. Cincinnati's eight point lead at the half increased to as many as 15 with just 13 minutes left to play. That's good. 45 to 30. Cincinnati leading by 15 points. You wouldn't believe it unless you were here. 15 points down. I saw, oh my gosh. Here comes Harkness in the lane, jump, shoots off, no good, but Smith is on that basket for him. And they knew how to slow the ball down, so we were really nervous. Here they go in that keep away game again. But we continue to keep our composure. Even when we were 15 points down, I never felt that we were out of that game. Here's Ron Miller, jump, shoot, score! Loyola was shrinking the deficit, despite their best player yet to make a field goal. I hit my first basket with just five minutes to go. Turn around, jumper's good! Gary made his first basket! He made it! He might do it! 48 to 43! And then I felt motivated. Then I stole the ball. Intercepted by Harkness! Here goes Gary! Plays it up and he scores! Beautiful! Harkness capped off a 15-3 Rambler run. Then that kicked in the gear. Here comes Harkness. He lays it up and it is tipped in by Hunter. The Ramblers were only down by one point. 12 seconds ago, I fouled the guy. Harkness fouled him purposely. He had to do it. Loyola's fate was in the hands of Larry Shingleton. Shingleton shot 95% from the free throw line. The left-handed shooter shoots and makes it. With no three-point line and little time left, another free throw would basically put the game out of Loyola's reach and give Cincinnati their third straight national championship. Instead, it is off, no good, and Leslie Hunter has got it. To Ron Miller, they got a fast break, down to Harkness. He jumps, he shoots, he scores, he scores! Oh, they did it! And now the motivation is with us. People forgot to take into account not only the skill level of our starting five, 
but the heart. Well, when David comes up against Goliath, what can he do? There it goes, down to Harkness. He's underneath, he lays it up, he scores! The Ramblers are out in front for the first time in this ball game. The Ramblers and Bearcats jockeyed for the upper hand, and with just one minute to play, the score was tied at 58. Loyola ball. They're going to go for one. I don't think there's any question about it. 50 seconds, 49, 48. The ball the teams, we slow the ball down. And this is a twist. Cincinnati, the team that always holds the ball. They're seeing what it feels like now. How does it feel? We'll find out in about 23 seconds because that's how much time's left in the ball game. The All-American Jerry Harkness is the one who's going to have the ball in his hands with around 10 seconds to go. I think everyone on all major continents knew that we were going to try to get the ball to Jerry. I guarantee you one thing, they'll give it to Harkness when it's time. Nine, eight, Harkness has got it, here he goes, he jumped. I went to the baseline and went up. I didn't feel it, and I could see in the corner of my eye less open. He passes out to Hunter, Hunter shoots. When he shot the ball, and this is hard to believe, but I heard his fingernails scratch the ball, and I knew we were in trouble with that shot. He misses it, and on the weak side where the rebound's coming off is Tom Thacker, they're all American, but he's not as big as Rouse, and Rouse goes over the top. And he doesn't bring it down, he just holds it up there and puts it back in. And that, as they said, was a shot heard around the world. All right, this has got it. Here he goes. He jumps. He passes out to Hunter. Hunter shoots. Off the rim. Rouse gets the score. It's over. It's over. We won. We won the ball game. Viola won the ball game. Oh, we won. 60 to 58. I relive it in my mind <laughs> almost daily. I see the shot. I see the rebound. I see the ball go in the bucket. It's the greatest feeling in the world. And we did it as a team. We won the ball game, and George Ireland is being hugged, kissed, and squeezed. Some of his players think that he was honestly a civil rights pioneer and rather consciously trying to make a better world for black ball players. Others think that he was completely cynical and he just wanted to win. He was the kind of guy that told you in the beginning, I'm not looking for friends here. I've got friends, and they're all in my family. As with most people, he was probably a combination of a lot of contradictory impulses. And the fact that he doesn't really ever resolve makes him more interesting, not less. I didn't realize when we won the national title how big it was. As you go back to Loyola's campus, People from Rogers Park were all out in the street. I think they closed Sheridan Road down. They had some sort of a parade. It was absolutely great. We all graduated. Matter of fact, Vic Rouse had five degrees. The friendships that I established 50 years ago is a wonderful feeling. We're the only team in the state of Illinois to win an NCAA basketball title. We're the first team inducted in the National Basketball Coaches Association. That's uh, quite an honor. Loyola's championship season transcended the sport. In 1963, its impact extended far beyond a basketball court and still resonates 50 years later. The world that we lived in at that time did not resemble the world today. Within two days, I was receiving phone calls from young African-American people saying, I now feel like I can do it. And you don't have any idea what you have done, that little part that you played. It's very important for our young people to be aware of why they have what they have today. If they see what we went through and how hard it was, maybe they'll realize the importance of it. Now, as you look at it, they play talent as opposed to color. Sports is an area of life that truly does lead the way in social change. So it's a wonderful feeling to know that you are a part of a positive change. All of this came from a little ball and putting it in a little basket. But if you finish second, it's like I'm finishing fourth. What difference does it make? Viola won the ball game. Oh, we won it. We won. 60 to 58. Congratulations, buddy. Thanks, Red. Congratulations. Oh, there you have it.